I leave a white and turbid wake, pale waters, paler cheeks, where'er I sail. Of all the characters in Hideo Kojima's series Metal Gear Solid, arguably none is more mysterious or captivating as the final antagonist, Metal Gear Solid V's Skullface. Wouldn't you agree? Listen, I may dwell in the dark. But I refuse to be judged by your standards, traitor. We'll be covering the historical roots of his origins, as well as analyzing the character's wider context, and ultimately begin explaining Skullface's evil plan. Let's get started. dug up some interesting facts about our skull-faced friend. Skullface, real name unknown. Born in Hungary, more specifically northern Transylvania after it reverted to Hungary from Romania. While he was young, the country allied with Germany as part of the Axis powers, but later during the war, it came under Soviet occupation. My village had an oilseed field and a fine factory. Every day, my friends and I would see our parents at work in that factory. That's all I had. All the world I knew. Then one day, aircraft came droning in from some far-off sky. The factory was bombed. Some spies had told them we were making weapons. <laughs> Those spies reported well. We made weapons, all right. As cartloads of rifles came in from the battlefields, we fixed them up and sent them back out. So our country could win. Or rather, so that little world we knew could continue. The building burned. We tried to flee outside. The crowd blocked the exit. The crowd of people. Hot. So hot. I tried to push through their legs and get ahead, but a boot in my stomach put me on the ground. The smoke of them burning filled me up. I heard my name called. But not for long. At the infirmary they carried me to, a nurse <clears throat> in the corridor saw me and remarked, as if it happened every day, they should let the poor thing die. Don't you die on me, dammit! He be dropping! Intubate, now! Carter. Those are the only words of my mother tongue I remember. It was the language of my village. Until foreign troops invaded. Then the last identity I had left, the words I spoke, were pulled from me. Torn from my elders, I was made to speak their language. With each new post, my masters changed, along with the words they made me speak. Words are peculiar. With each change, I changed too. My thoughts, personality, how I saw right and wrong. War changed me. And not only my visage. Words began to kill. 
I was invaded by words, burrowing and breeding inside me. A philosopher once said, it is no nation we inhabit, but a language. Make no mistake, our native tongue is our true fatherland. My fatherland, my truth was stolen from me. And so was my past. All that's left is the future. And mine is revenge. On those who bleach off the words of their fellow man. As a boy, Skullface's life went up in flames. Perhaps that is what fuels his fixation with fire. The Hungarians struggled for independence, but the Soviets came down. Hard. Just like he said, time and again the country was ruled by a foreign tongue. When he was a young boy, he lost his native language. The bedrock for any developing child. His country, his family, his face, his identity, everything was stolen from him. All he had left was his skull. Skullface first tried his hand at espionage during all the chaos from the war. Agents, military officials, and soldiers who operated out of Hungary during the war vanished over the course of several months. This Soviet spy hunt rocked the counter-intel world. Mysterious fatal illnesses, accidental deaths, drownings, people having strokes behind closed doors. Just like Stalin, no one knew who was behind it. But all you need to do was look for who had the motive. They were all taken out by a man without a face. And now we've got an idea of how he did it, too. My skin would never feel anything again. This face would be burned again, in torture, at foreign hands. But I, I still writhe in that burning factory, doused in scalding rapeseed oil. That's all I have to feel, that pain. All I have to remind me I exist here. <laughs> He'd gotten revenge for his people, but he wasn't finished. Skullface defected to the West, eventually ended up with the SAS. That's where he met Zero. It's possible he began planning this whole thing back then. It's hard to say. In any case, Zero made him his XO. He always did have a thing for oddballs. But this one was set to lead a unit no one else would know about. When Zero created Fox, he also formed XOF as a support team. An unconventional special forces unit designed to support Fox, make it stronger. With Skullface given the orders. Zero never even told the boss about it. Nor the CIA, naturally. If Fox was Zero's silver bullet, XOF was the recoil when he pulled the trigger. Just like Newton's third law. I came to realize I mustn't die. I'm their last hope. All those who perished and left me here. I have to accomplish something. If I don't, their will will be swept out of this world. <laughs> Nineteen sixty four, Soviet territory. Fox's first mission. Any mess you made, I was there to clean up. You completed your task, and admirably. The information you returned was far more than enough to fill our pockets. With it, our futures became, more or less, set in stone. While you were with Fox, Skullface was operating behind the scenes. Sometimes as your backup, sometimes as a mole or a scout, sometimes as your cleanup crew. Fox's tail, making sure the mission succeeded and that you survived. And then the Major came to me with an idea. Washington doesn't know how to spend money, he said. I'd like to redirect it. His goal was an organization dedicated solely, covertly, 
to supporting America. Cypher. Once upon a time, there were two young men who idolized a hero called The Boss. One day, they suddenly lost the point of origin. The Cypher. That was like a mother to them. Unable to come to terms with their sorrow, they each decided to carry on the will of their hero. But they could not agree on what that meant. In the end, they became bitter enemies. And the zero from which they both started was split into two. East, West, First World, Third. It was only a matter of time before someone took you down. And that was XOF. Officially, they're an anti-terror unit under the CIA. In reality, they're Cypher's private strike force. They lured you to Cuba using Chico, the Nicaraguan revolutionary kid, and Paz, a mole who worked for Cypher as bait. While you were gone, XOF, posing as a nuclear inspection team, stormed Mother Base. At the same time, C4 they placed on the strut legs went off. The whole thing went down in minutes. XOF. Kisses and hugs followed by a big F you. All because of Miller's blind spot. A back door into Mother Base no one suspected. You remember a certain scientist. Huey was responsible for bringing the inspection team on board. Giving the enemy a perfect opportunity to hit you at home. You were returning from Cuba when it happened. Mother Base came damn close to taking you with it into the Caribbean. Those of your men out on assignment returned right away. They refused to believe the wreckage in the water they found was Mother Base. But they checked the coordinates again and again until reality finally settled in. You were supposed to die that day. That was XOF's primary objective. As far as most folks know, you did. The first doctor to see you wasn't even sure what he was looking at. Before they'd even finished operating, your men moved you to that hospital in Cyprus. It was a woman named Eva who arranged that. Rings a bell, hmm? Most men in your condition would have been written off right from the start. But you survived. You went straight down to hell, and they pulled you out. Your eye wide open. Full of venom. The days of Naked Snake are long gone. Welcome back, Venom Snake. This world still needs you. Nine years ago, he was exiled to South Africa, stripped of political power. The upshot said he ceased being a serious threat, in Cypher's eyes anyway. They eased up on surveillance, giving him an opening to establish his own military unit, one that answered to his will alone. Those men likely had no idea their orders were coming from Skullface. They probably didn't even know the organization was a part of Cypher at all. Anyway, it was in South Africa where he found renewed interest in parasites. All we have is circumstantial evidence, but here's my theory. It was Cypher who started developing the vocal cord parasites as bioweapons, parasitic weapons, and Africa was the testing ground for them. As Code Talker said, their purpose is the ethnic cleansing of only those who speak a particular language. So they could do a weapon of mass destruction to eradicate specific groups races, ethnicities, or colonies by the language they speak. Or a kind of absolute language control. Or maybe a tool for those arrogant fools to build some misguided utopia. I can see plenty of uses for them. However, in practical terms, they wouldn't be as dangerous as you'd think. Counteracting the parasites is easy, after all. Cut them out of your throat to save your life, or just don't talk. That also prevents the infection from spreading. So if the international community were to find out about them, they'd no longer be the threat they were conceived to be. In which case, their targets would be limited to minority groups as a deterrent or a terrorist tool. It's hard to imagine Cypher developing something like that as a main weapon for their arsenal. That leads me to think we've only tugged on one little thread in Cypher's grand tapestry. An obscure corner of their work, possibly forgotten altogether. In any case, things changed. When Skullface was forced to relocate to Africa and he saw that threat dangling. And when he discovered the vocal cord parasites, he began to make his plan. 
wipe the English language out of existence. Free the world, not by taking men's lives, but by taking their tongues. In his eyes, the greatest symbiotic parasite the world's ever known isn't microbial. It's linguistic. Words are what keeps civilization, our world, alive. The idea to have an AI act for Zero came about in 74, when the data from the mammal pod penetrated NORAD. Clearly an AI couldn't be allowed to make its own decisions. So they would take away its ability to act, and instead create a specialized system in which the AI, bound by specific rules, filters the massive amounts of data it collects before passing it on to people, subtly guiding their decision making. A system of the people, by the people, for the people. So they began researching how to do it. It's called the Patriots. It's all about ensuring that the concepts driving society appears the same in the mind of each person in that society. About maintaining the identity of the individual, and yet having that individual willingly make up part of the whole. I guess it's fitting to call that patriotism. Creating a united world. America is a country of liberty, a meeting of immigrants. Instead of simply assimilating, its citizens live alongside others. Their roots are varied, diverse. America's never been made up of just one people. But he tried to forge a single consciousness for it and from it. The idea that every citizen would use free will to night behind their country. Unilateralism like that can't be entrusted to any one individual. So the Major sought a system that used information, words, to control the subconscious. And then it hit me. It was he who should feel my wrath. He and the code he chose as basis for control. Language codes, information codes, beamed all around us, genetic codes spanning history. By controlling the codes, Cypher Zero intends to unify. Codes implanted into our heads, sucking our minds dry as it spreads from one host to the next. A parasite upon this earth, that is what Zero is. As one born into this world, he's afflicted. I hold him responsible for killing my freedom. Killing all traces of my past. Killing any promise of a future. We are all but dead men forced to walk upon this earth. A world reduced to Zero. Cypher plans to use its codes to control the world. They think they can. And the mother tongue of all those codes is English. The word became flesh. The final parasite. It knows English. An English strain of the vocal parasite. I will exterminate the English language. With this, I'll rid the world of infestation. All men will breathe free again, reclaim their past, present, and future. This is no ethnic cleanser. It is a liberator to free the world from zero. Let the world be. Sans lingua franca, the world will be torn suddenly. And then it shall be free. People will suffer, of course. A phantom pain. The world will need a new common tongue. A language of mutants. My metal gears shall be the thread by which all countries are bound together. Inequality. No words will be needed. 
every man will be forced to recognize his neighbor. People will swallow their pain. They will link lost hands. The world will become one. This war is peace. Skullface forced me to turn parasites into weapons. Creatures with which we are supposed to coexist. Meanwhile, that foundation I worked with focus solely on the human genome. Apparently thinking that manipulating it would get them whatever new form they want. Both ways are mistakes. Neither is a true superorganism. I am Dene. By speaking with those living inside me, we enhance one another and enjoy harmonious growth. Such was the original purpose of my research. You have made me remember this. <laughs> well, it's an honor. You can travel the world, but you won't find another place like this. If the whole world was like this base, I think the peoples of the world would bid farewell to fighting for good. Maybe that's what the boss wanted in the end. We only have his word to go on, but Skullface's goal was revenge against those who'd use language to subjugate people. Those corrupting a people's identity by forcing a new tongue on them. Those using the power of language to control information. Naturally, that set his sights on Zero. To Zero, English was simply the most convenient code. But to Skullface, English was a parasite. And by eradicating it, he'd stop the world from being eaten away. If that didn't work, he was ready to see the world scorched by nuclear fire. To save language, culture, and race from annihilation, he was willing to overstep the hands of the Doomsday Clock. That is, of course, if you believe anything he had to say. <laughs> I figure South Africa started getting serious about nuclear weapons production in 75. South Africa was previously suspected of developing nuclear weapons. It already had a conspicuous presence at the UN because of apartheid and its armed expansionism. But when neighboring Angola and Mozambique became socialist countries in 74, South Africa felt hounded into a corner. So it accelerated its nuclear program to protect itself. Three years later, the Soviets discovered a test facility, and two years after that, an American satellite observed a flash in the southern Indian Ocean. It said this was South Africa conducting a nuclear test with the help of a certain ally. Skullface used the situation in South Africa to get this ally to lend a hand. They both wanted nukes, so it was a mutually beneficial relationship. On the surface, anyway. In 74, the government was still able to get by with bluffing that it had a nuclear arsenal. But the year after, word spread that an independent armed group in the Caribbean was crushed by Cypher for possessing a WMD. That's right, boss. What happened to you and your men was the reason South Africa decided to push ahead with nuclear development. A force independent of any country getting its hands on a nuke. That was a threat to the existence of countries everywhere. It wasn't just South Africa. Your presence pushed a lot of countries to get nukes. The world was scared of you. You were a threat to more than just the Cold War. If nations are gears in a machine, you had the power to smash them loose and watch the whole world grind to a halt. Ever since the attack on your unit nine years ago, the name Big Boss has become known the world over. What do you mean? Those of your men who survived traveled far and wide. They fought throughout the world. In fact, they're part of the reason we have all these PFs now. Every one of them suffered their own phantom pain from losing you. Talking about you wherever they went helped to heal their wounds. Your actions and words, your legend, has been told on every battlefield they've set foot on. Obviously, as the tales have spread, the truth's been distorted, painted over. Big Boss sacrificed himself to show us the threat that Cypher poses. He sounded a warning, so it goes. A warning? Too much power destroys the hands that hold it. Apparently, you chose to be a living example of that. I never said any of that. 
The moment any truth is passed on, it starts turning into fiction. The problem is, fiction inspires people more than facts. To the world, you're now the legendary mercenary big boss. The lessons you've taught the PS are the reason they're so widespread. They're the reason they've survived. And you know what they all aspire to? To one day go nuclear, just like you did, and stand up to Cypher. Of all the stupid things you could do, they'll never understand what you really wanted. Heroes are misunderstood. It takes a man of the same caliber to understand what drives them. Bottom line is, these guys want to be like their hero big boss. And deep down, they all have their eyes on nuclear weapons. They say that a nuke is the only means of standing against Cypher. Skullface was forced to develop his English strain out of sight of Cypher's network. Naturally, he couldn't use the greenhouse facility Cypher had set up and filled with guinea pigs. Skullface must have found some secret place to create his precious few English parasites, hiding all evidence like a man cheating on his wife. Somewhere, an entirely standalone environment. And when his plan entered its final phase, he must have made the place disappear. Some little room could be anywhere, but now nowhere at all. We'll never know where he did it, but to elude Cypher's surveillance, it couldn't have been big. I believe Skullface was telling the truth. There were only ever three samples of the English language strain. Why activate Sahelanthropus in Afghanistan? This is how Skullface wanted things to play out. The Soviet Union secretly develops a new type of nuclear weapon and successfully deploys it in Afghanistan. Revealing the existence of Sahelanthropus results in a return to the glory days of the Cold War. The threat it poses reignites the nuclear arms race between the world's major powers. The demand for nuclear weapons increases around the globe. What if you then introduced a nuclear weapon anyone could get their hands on? Non-nuclear nations, militant groups of all shapes and sizes, they'd all jump at the chance. Soholanthropus was a marketing tool to sell nukes all around the world. But I think it's safe to say that plan was stamped out before it got up and running. The world's intelligence agencies never did turn up anything conclusive on it. After all, Soholanthropus vanished before word could spread. Everything that's happened is already a fading memory never to join the pages of history. Except for Cypher. Cypher won't forget. They'll already be working on something quietly beneath the surface. They'll use the pieces of data scraped together from this incident to build their own bipedal weapon. It'll take them a long time to complete it, but for now, the greed sector have found their new life's work. We'll have to be ready too. Cypher will rewrite the records, and I will vanish from human memory. But the thirst for revenge that I have planted will infest the system! No one can stop it now! Sahalanthropus will unleash that thirst unto the future! Major, I'm burning up! Boss, get out of there!
The character Skullface seems at first a blank space, a non-entity whose existence is all but inexpressible in language. Tell me, what do you see? Hmm? You have eyes? What do your eyes see? <laughs> yes, that's right. You see a skull face. You see me. This skull is who I am. My mark, my proof of humanity. I have no country. No language. I have no face. But I haven't lost my skull. Do you realize what you're doing? Cypher is watching. Let go of me! You will be next. Your hideous face will... Repulsive, isn't it? Borders, even our faces will be irrelevant. The nature of communication itself will change, and it will make mankind whole again. Some things can't be undone. My face was taken from me. There's no taking that back. A face means nothing when one's soul is able to communicate directly with another. I have no intention of hiding behind your technological veil, Major. I wear my broken visage, this skull in the open so that I may never forget what I've lost. You. I know how you feel. I've felt that. What are you- So show me that I'm not the only one. That you too can return to this world for revenge. Do you see me? Don't die. Don't die! Ah. The chain of retaliation is what will truly bind this world together as one. Ah. He's just, after all, a skull face. A half a man. But we later learn this was not always the case. See now, there must be more to it than that. What? They are in you. You use this land to breed more of my children. And not just here. No. In pursuit of your ethnic cleansers, you sifted through many language strains, finding hosts, breeding more and more. You would have been infected in the process infected with countless strains. <sighs> Most likely your mother tongues as well. Romania, Northern Transylvania. You found that one too. Yes, the Hungarian strain that responds to the CK's dialect. Silence! Black Anna. It is you who shall pay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Skullface's real face and name may have been lost to history, but one thing we can say for sure, Skullface was born in northern Transylvania, in the region known as CK's land. Skullface, in other words, is a CK's. Immediately then, we have to acknowledge a veiled literary allusion here. It's to Bram Stoker's Dracula. The Count too was CK's. You might say Dracula in 1897 put this obscure region and people on the map. Zeklis in the east and north. I am going among the latter who claim to be descended from Attila and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the 11th century, they found the Huns settled in it. 
I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians, as if it were the center of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Memo. I must ask the Count all about them. This is no mere trivia. As we'll see, the CKs were selected for a reason. References to Dracula are merely one part of a much wider, crucially important context for this character. So what is that context? Well, for starters, the origins of the CKs are no less mysterious than Skullface's himself. Rumored to have descended from the invading armies of Attila the Hun, the CKs were shaped as much by linguistic as geopolitical isolation. Their name reflects their role during much older eras. CKs literally, and this is huge, means border guards. This exceptionally proud and independent people were forged in the fires of a form of warfare necessary for keeping the peace. Border Patrol. Constantly fighting outside enemies strengthened the CK's sense of cultural identity. They are said to have remained fiercely independent in spirit even to this very day. The thing about the CKs is they're very much caught in between identities, even down to competing narratives of origin. The Hungarians call them the original, almost Edenic class of Hungarian, while in a different interpretation they are denaturalized, pure-blooded Romanians in disguise. That's because, originally, the CK land in northern Transylvania, like I said, was on a border, and the CK were the border guards with both dominant cultural influences present of Hungary and Romania, not to mention also German-speaking Saxons. In general, this was more of the status quo before the rise of modern politics and its paradigm of nation-states and nationalism. Not the absence of conflict among all groups, but a fuzziness or messiness in terms of how identities break down within heterogeneous regions. But as a group, the CKs were actually quite homogenous within their portion of northern Transylvania. In fact, many comparisons might be drawn here between them and, say, the Japanese. Like many groups in the region, the CKs have a long and winding history over the eons. But in general, for generations, they had a status not totally unlike, say, that of the American whalemen. In exchange for risking the clash of bone and sinew along their military frontier, the warrior caste of the CKs enjoyed greater rights and privileges, and in particular, independence. But it was here, on the subject of liberty and revolution, that, beginning in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, in CK land all hell broke loose swept up like many European societies at this time in the influenza-like spread of enlightened revolution, which had for its patient zero America, the CKs agitated for and then fought in a sweeping war over whether or not they would unify as a polity with Hungary, whether or not they would still receive the same privileges that they had historically enjoyed. It was partially out of this revolutionary struggle in the mid-19th century there came about a dual monarchy, and with it, the shared compromise of a so-called Austro-Hungarian Empire. Transylvania then just became part of the Kingdom of Hungary, while the long-standing privileges that had been afforded to the exceptional CKs were revoked in the name of equality. Before then, they had enjoyed existence as egalitarian and tax-exempt with moderate political autonomy of their own, including a somewhat separate administrative and electoral body. Their distinct cultural identity, though, had just been defaced in order to level the playing field and create a modern Hungary. This would not be the last time that the very identity of the CK's people would become subject to outside influence. The predominantly rural region of Transylvania did not factor much into the concerns of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was only when that empire collapsed in World War I, alongside the so-called sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, that ages-old animosities and jealousies all over the world 
but in our case, between Hungary and Romania, quickly threatened to tear this region apart. Following World War I, Transylvania went from being a border region of Hungary to the straight center of so-called Greater Romania with the Treaty of Trianon in 1920. Now this concentration of Hungarian speakers in the heart of Romania would present a major problem. To quote Stefano Batoni's 2018 book, Stalin's Legacy in Romania, quote, Besides the diplomatic struggle between Romania and Hungary for territorial possession of the CK land, the region fueled a complex intellectual competition over the quote-unquote correct interpretation of national past and the ethnic essence of CK-ness, end quote. Fast forward to World War II, and the region of Northern Transylvania suddenly becomes more important. In 1940, to reward the Hungarians for having joined the Axis powers, the second Vienna Award made Transylvania Hungary's again. Immediately afterwards, apparently, is when Skullface is born. The region's first linked to the rest of Hungary by railway only as late as 1942. But what only became evident with the arrival of war against the Soviet Union was that Hitler had played the Hungarians and Transylvanians like a damn fiddle. The way the borders had been drafted on the map by Hitler and Mussolini made defending northern Transylvania from attack basically impossible. Then in August of 1944, Romania changed sides, allowing to emerge with Hungary a war of retribution. Part of the reason Romania now fought for the Allies against Hungary, who in turn fought for the Axis against Romania, was the one region both nations demanded demanded if only to solidify some sense of identity distinct from the other, some proof that they belonged, that they existed as their own nation. The region of Northern Transylvania. Not that the CKs were in any way themselves immune to the spread of nationalism at this time either. Nationalism awakened there as everywhere else during and between both world wars. Take, for example, the curiously named Association of CK University Students, or SIFA. Writes Batoni, quote, This attempt at reshaping the collective identity put at the center the idea of serving the people by rebuilding the ethnic foundations of the Hungarian minority community. Minority life was to become an everyday struggle to preserve a way of life and the minority's irreducible diversity. End quote. To quote the blog, Europe Between East and West, quote, By the time of Stoker's Dracula, the CK were little more than a unique cultural afterthought of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were a mystery in a mysterious land surrounded by wild, dramatically beautiful nature, given to insular, obscure customs and beholden only to their own traditions. End quote. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, predicated on a dual monarchy, was by the end of World War I coming apart. It was splitting along many fault lines, dividing many, many different ethnic and national groups, like the sea case. The Treaty of Trianon split the region into new polities, redrawing its map. Suddenly, the sea case, who spoke Hungarian, were part of Romania. You'll, of course, remember the opening of The Phantom Pain. What this sequence tells us in so many words is that sometimes the truth is terrible and never more so when that truth is loss. The pain of losing limbs, never able to erase memories of that truth you were born with, pieces of yourself that are no longer your own. This must be how it feels to be, as but one example, CK's. First CK's land became part of Romania. Briefly, it was redrawn on the map as Hungarian again. Like much of Central and Eastern Europe, the region was passed back and forth from one ideologically extreme totalitarianism to the other, invaded and even reinvaded by the Nazis and the Soviets multiple times. Your favorite song, Nicola Bart. Immigrants wrongly executed. 
but their deaths served as a message to others. That ours is a society that murders the innocent. Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? shall not see triumph. You've been most helpful, and I have one last use for you. To you I give a magnificent end, but an end nonetheless. The final moment is yours. We heard from the advance team. Everything's right on schedule. The C4 has been planted on the legs. The strike team and decoy team are in position. And we have confirmation that Big Boss's chopper is lifted off. A shame I won't see him. But at least I'll get a look at his body. Time for us to move out too. But first, let's stop by and see the boy. I want Big Boss to hear his little diary. Hopefully, he's still a good listener. 